Margaret D.Y. She's involved in NHS, Science National Honor Society, Math National Honor Society, German National Honor Society. She's in marching band. She's in winter percussion. She does it all, and she does it all very, very well. So she is a well-respected member of our DY student community, and I'm so excited for you to hear her speech tonight. So welcome, Molly. Naturalist Sir David Attenborough once said, it's surely our responsibility to do everything within our power to create a planet that provides a home not just for us, but for all life on Earth. I can remember traveling to Providence, Rhode Island on a school trip one day and seeing something that really shocked me. As I rode a bus along the city's river on a gloomy fall day, I saw a mountain of junk sitting on its shore. Plastic bags ripped open to reveal rotting garbage and tattered clothes lay atop the dirt. A plastic coffee maker sat at the peak of the mound, its top ripped completely off. We only passed by it for a moment, but the sadness that we are making and throwing away more than the earth can handle has stuck with me since. A planet where we have trash piles in every city is not the home I want for us. Neither is one where extreme weather strips everything from those who experience it. Such is the current story of our planet. Though naturalists like Attenborough have been warning humanity of the consequences that come with their actions for decades, humans have continued to drastically alter the planet and increase climate change. The environmental crisis is real and it's a major concern for everyone. Unless we change our behaviors, the world as we know it will no longer exist. Overproduction and consumerism play a major role in the decreasing health of the planet. The current market for many countries is one where there is no shortage of every object imaginable. But with so many goods at their fingertips, people have become very wasteful. In fact, the UN estimates that a third of food ends up in the trash. Fast fashion heavily influences many cultures, where new clothes are bought and disposed of as fashion trends come and go. This is simply unsustainable. To have brand new clothes manufactured with each returning fad is an environmental nightmare. Not only do greenhouse gas emissions and water usage rise, but the clothes ending up in landfills are unmanageable. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, 17 million tons of textiles were discarded in 2017. If the amount of waste in landfills continues to build up, entire habitats will be destroyed as more room is needed for all this garbage. Plastics certainly don't help with this problem. About 300 million tons of plastics are produced each year and about half of that is single use. Over 91% of plastic ends up in the environment or in landfills, where it will sit for hundreds of years. It is estimated that it takes 450 years for a plastic bottle to break down. But as National, Ge but as National Geographic has stated, the truth is this number could be astronomically low. Some scientists aren't convinced that plastics break down completely. Plastic is a hazard to ecosystems, as it can easily be swallowed by animals and the chemicals it contains can be toxic to organisms. By 2050, there could be more plastic than fish in the ocean. If consumerism like this continues, ecosystems will suffer greatly. Carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are currently higher than they've ever been. This is mostly due to the use of fossil fuels which is the largest contributor to global warming. When coal, oil, and natural gas are burned, they release gases and pollutants such as carbon dioxide and methane into the air, which trap heat in the atmosphere. As well as manufacturing, everyday activities rely on fossil fuels, from transportation to heat production. Even the food we eat contributes to the global carbon footprint, which causes many environmental changes. 
sea ice melts, causing sea levels to rise, and weather patterns change. Droughts become longer and more severe, and weather becomes more extreme. In the summer of 2022, Europe faced a heat wave so severe it killed thousands of people. Many European nations were not prepared for temperatures reaching over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, despite warnings from scientists that this would be expected with climate change. Just a few months later, Hurricane Ian hit Florida with such ferocity, families were left without homes weeks after it landed. Weather like this is not a coincidence. Extreme and deadly events happening so close together are because of climate change and it will only get worse. I want you to imagine a world, maybe 50 years from now, where climate change has continued at its current rate. The ice caps have melted and sea levels have risen well over a foot, as projected by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Millions of homes and entire cities are underwater, with Dubai being among the first to experience major flooding. Floating around the shore and built up around us are mounds of litter and garbage. There's nowhere else to put it. Mass migrations have brought millions of people to cities in search of relief, but they're met with a housing and waste management crisis. Urban sprawl has destroyed habitats, and as much as 50% of species on Earth have gone extinct. Smog and pollution fill the air, and in the West, Masks aren't just for avoiding contagious diseases anymore. It is clear that there's much to be done in the way of helping our planet. Overproduction and, consu and consumption of plastics and other goods are causing a buildup of waste that cannot be dealt with at this rate. Climate change is being spurred by human activities and is causing immense damage to the climate and ecosystems. 50 years from now, I want to be able to ride a bus preferably electric, along the Providence River and see clean soil. I want to be able to walk the city streets and smell fresh air, not burning diesel. And I want to hear the chirps and calls from so many species I can't count them all on my two hands. I truly believe this future is possible, but the only way the earth will have time to heal is if everyone cares about it. And I can't help but wonder how many trash piles that'll take. Thank you very much. That was incredible. Thank you. Everybody was on their edge of their seat. It was, it was great. It's, wow. Thank you very much. Molly, I just want to say congratulations. Obviously, that took a lot of work, and um, not that we're going to sit and fact check you, but wow, your <laughs> facts were amazing. Um, to remember all of that, I could, could never do that myself. So congratulations for what you've accomplished, and also for um, opening other people's eyes to some of the research that you clearly have done and um, done such a good job with. I hope people will listen. Okay, uh, our next up is our student representatives, Kristen and Rosanna. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm so glad that Molly gave that speech because we actually had her on our list and we were gonna talk about her, so I'm glad that you guys actually got to hear it. That was actually my first time hearing the whole thing in full because she actually um, performed it for our AP English class like months ago, probably in November when she was first starting out this competition stuff. So it was very amazing. That was a very good speech, Molly, thank you. It just shows like the more things that the DY students are involved in, it's like crazy. Like who would have thought that like someone from DY is going out and winning state competitions and probably even more, like it's, it's just insane. So I'm super proud of our students here. Um, so yeah, we had Molly with the Lions Club winning her statewide competition um, recently. And I think one thing Ms. Rita forgot to mention, which she usually does, Ms. Rita talks very highly, and it also shows how much the staff supports our students here. They're just so amazing. But um, Molly has won a total of $2,700 before me in these competitions. So I think most recently she just won 1500 at the statewide competition, which is insane. So it just shows how like these programs are helping students get involved in schools, get involved in their communities, show things that they like, and also benefit. She's putting in all this hard work, and she's actually receiving something from it, which is amazing. And she's sharing her word with people, and people are learning. Like, I'm just shocked by all these facts that came out, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, 
I know I'm contributing to bad stuff. Like, I'm going to start fixing my habits and <coughs> doing as much as I can to um, help our earth. But uh, <laughs> moving on, we have spring sports. Um, they're go doing very well. Most of our teams are doing amazing. But I think most of them are starting to wrap up now. It's um, coming on the end of May. So I think we're going to push through maybe the beginning of June, depending on who's going to um, regionals and, like, divisionals, stuff like that. Um, but our track team, as you guys know, I talk a lot about that, is doing amazing. We have two track teams who are going to the Nike Nationals in Oregon, which is crazy. So we're um, currently fundraising, trying our best to get as much money as we can to get those teams out there so they don't have to pay too much to compete. Um, we have a sprint medley, and that consists of Sienna Lousy. She is a sophomore. Um, Brianna Braham, she's also a sophomore. Ronique McFarland, she's a senior. And... Um, Rose Caro, who's also a senior. So they are, that's four people together. They're running a sprint medley, which can, it's just a mile together, all together. It's like two people will run a 200, which is half of a lap. One person will run a 400, which is a full lap. And then someone else is going to run an 800, which is two laps. So it's really good. These girls just did amazing. They broke a school record um, like two weeks ago. And then this Friday, they just went and they broke another school record performing it again. And it was actually a different team. So it just shows you how great our girls are. They are amazing and super versatile. And then we also have a four by eight, which is four people running. I think it consists of Sienna Lousy again, the sophomore, um, Chloe Azoff, she is a junior, um, Rose Caro, she's a senior, and there's one more girl. I cannot seem to remember who it is, and I'm so sorry to whoever that is. Um, but yeah, they're, they are going all the way to Oregon, and they're going to run um, two miles combined, so they're each going to run an 800, which is two laps, and they are doing amazing. They keep breaking the record. They just go out, and they set it, and then they break it again, and they set it, and they break it again. So it's just amazing seeing um, how much the girls here at DY do, and our track team is working very hard, just as all our other sports teams are. That was crazy. All right. <laughs> so... Um, I've got a couple finishing things. Uh, our spring musical Chicago went absolutely fantastic. All of my cast absolutely knocked it out of the park. Um, I'm a huge, um, humongous supporter of DY Theater, and those kids are incredible. Like, um, our, there are three main characters. I was one of them. A sophomore was another one named Mo O'Neill. And then we had a freshman who was our third main character and it, uh, who played Billy Flynn, and his name is um, Cairo, and he is phenomenal there's going to be a such a huge um spark in uh musicals and programs in the future for the dy theater co so i'm very proud of them for that um a couple administrative things uh spirit week is this week leading up to prom which is this saturday this spirit week today was pajama day tomorrow's biker v surfer um the wednesday will be iconic duo day uh thursday is gone fishing and then friday is dy day and then prom is that is this Saturday, which I still have to buy shoes for. So that's cool. Um, let's see. Senior week activities are also all booked. Senior week typically pays for itself. Um, and the senior class, we've done a lot of fundraising. So that all taken care of. Um, all of the seniors should have booked um, all of their activities beforehand. But if you do have anything else you need to book, and it's just still taking some requests, but just be snappy about it because we got to book them soon. Um, also, for graduating parents, there are a couple things that you can still buy. There's the um, senior class t-shirt. There's the yearbooks that are still on sale, uh, yard signs, graduation posters, which we all, all make um, homegrown, fun fact. Um, all of our – we can make wa big waterproof banners to hang on your porch and stuff, and we can make all of that in the graphic design classroom, which I have a hand in making as well, so they're very cool. Um, AP testing is finally done. That was – some it went really well um i know a lot of people that uh had struggled in ap's in the past but everyone i've talked to and the senior class at least has been super confident about how their ap's went this year and i know a bunch of juniors that are excited for it to be over so that went well um 10th grade mcat math mcas is tomorrow and after that that's their like last big graduation testing hurrah um but yeah i don't know i just want to take a quick second um and I know Rosanna already gouged about that but as a theater kid can I just say how crazy it is to have an entire speech memorized because that is ridiculous like that's like three pages of words you have to have very specific because they quiz you on it and, oh my god congratulations Molly because that is wild like <laughs> that is fantastic um and also seriously it's just 
it's kind of wild. I'm in, I'm the senior class president and I'm kind of in a super like reflective mood right now because I've, I have to make a big speech at, during a senior last assembly and I have to read the names of graduation and I'm just kind of watching to like both gather material to write in the speech, but also just watching everything that we do at this school. Like I'm a super involved person, don't get me wrong. I join every single program that I can because that's just kind of how I do things. But oh my God, DY is wild it's amazing how many things like I know that I know I knew the track team was crazy when I was here as an eighth grader but like now I'm hearing seniors that I am friends with break records every other week I'm hearing like just all of our sports are always incredible our my theater company I've grown up with it that has been my program and I've just like watched it go from I thought it was amazing as an eighth grader but now I'm like god I don't even I don't even know but I just want to say thank you, everybody, for, you know, I know that this isn't, the administrative part isn't the fun part. I guarantee you I know that. Um, but thanks for sticking with us, and we really do appreciate it. I'd just like to say that um, as a person who has been watching the theater program for a number of years, and uh, as a person who loves theater also, this was the best production we have ever had. And I see it just getting better and better. And a shout out to uh, Ms. McMahon, who does an amazing job helping our students to do their best work. So um, theater's important, music's important, speaking is important, it's all important. And what's most important is that every student finds a spot for themselves here at DY. So if your friends haven't gotten themselves involved in something, take it from our commercial leader over here. <laughs> There's something for everybody here. So that's what makes a school really great is when all the kids get involved. And we certainly wish you all the best in your, uh, well, it won't be your retirement exactly, <laughs> your graduation from DY and um, look forward to hearing about some of the things that you do in the future. And we look forward to having Rosanna continue on as a student rep in the future. You guys have been really excellent and amazing. And before we turn it over to our next presenter, I just want to give a little shout out to our middle school, who got a shout out from a guy riding a ferry from Nantucket one night. Um, as our sixth grade girls uh, were coming back from their uh, Dolphins softball game over at Nantucket. Uh, this gentleman uh, took the time to write an email to the coach. And I always think those are things are important because, you know, what goes on inside, maybe everybody doesn't see it, but what goes on out there is really important when people see our kids and they see them doing all the right things. So Miss uh, Jocelyn Phipps is uh, one of our coaches over at the middle school. And uh, the email goes like this. I believe you are the girls' softball team coach and guidance counselor for them. I sat in the front of the downstairs ferry on the way back to Hyannis with a few of the players from your Dolphins softball team. I just wanted to send a message to say that the group of girls that sat in front of the ferry on the way back to Hyannis were a great group of kids. Your school should be very proud to have the five or six girls that I sat with representing and honoring your school. They were super polite, showed a great deal of respect to myself and the other gentleman that was sitting in our section. I could understand that with 35-ish students that were on board, it could have been crazy and hectic, but I was amazed how well behaved they were. I truly hope my kids can grow up and act just like them if they were ever put in the same situation. Oh, it did get a little rowdy at the end, but it was all fun and games, and everyone around us was having a good laugh with them. I would also like to thank you guys for the slice of pizza I hope they, <laughs> they have a great rest of the season. And that was uh, thank you from Brent Bo Emels, I believe is his name. And I just thought that was important to recognize that kind of stuff publicly. So thanks for everything, and thanks for making us always look good. Joe, if I could. I'd go ahead, Joe. Um, Chris and I wanted to thank you. And a lot of times people don't realize that we, um, you know, the senior <laughs> leaves here and we might have another meeting and you guys are in your senior phase and 
we don't get to see you or thank you um, because you contribute to us. And, you know, I know you mentioned about the administrative and we do the budget stuff, but our top priority is student achievement. And we get to see the student achievement. And I love the fact that we have two people here so that they can see they get another year. We get to see them another year and hear the things. And, uh, and Molly, fantastic job. Uh, if you want to make a little extra money, Phil and I will probably pay you uh, to be effective speakers, tutor us in effective speaking. So, But thank you so much, and uh, good luck, Kristen, all you do. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Carol. Okay, so I'd like to turn it over to Sherry Santini for a report on uh, our humanities department and how we're doing in, in that regard. I cannot follow that up. I do not have this memorized, <laughs> so I'm going to read okay. from my notes. It's Either do I. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share with you what we've been working on in the world of humanities. More than 30 years ago, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishops wrote an article about how children's books can be windows into the realities of others and mirrors that reflects the lives of the readers. Books are sometimes windows, offering views of worlds that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. When lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. This mirror allows the reader to see themselves in their own experiences. She goes on to say, when children cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read or when the images they see are distorted, negative, or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in the society of which they are a part. Why is this important? Because we are responsible for the text we place in front of students and the learning experiences we create. The use of culturally relevant books improves engagement, increases motivation, <clears throat> and strengthens the student's ability to make connections and interpret texts. Opening windows can open minds. Students must be taught to read the word and the world. They must acquire higher levels of knowledge, understand the relationship between knowledge and action, develop a commitment to improve the world, and acquire the skills needed to participate in civic action. Representation in Dennis Yarmouth as of the 2022 report in DESE shows that our African American student population is 10.3%, our Hispanic student population is 12.9%, Asian population 2.5%, and our white students make up 66%. And what this tells us is that we need to take a look at our text for Hispanic students to ensure appropriate representation is present. We are also looking at representation for our students and families with disabilities and those who belong to the LGBTQ community. Allow me to take a moment for a quick recap of some of the work accomplished since the last time I presented to the school committee in December of 2018. And yes, I did check, that's true. <clears throat> the Literacy Curriculum Leadership Council published curriculum overview documents for grades K through seven the purpose of these documents was to provide stakeholders, educational staff, families and caregivers, and a community with a year at a glance within that content area for each grade level. <clears throat> these documents can be found under the Office of Instruction tab on the district's website. We also published scope and pacing guides for teachers in K through 7 to ensure alignment to standards both horizontally and vertically, consistency of learning experiences across the district, and clear communication of expectations. This was also the year that we were able to establish a social studies curriculum leadership council. This group immediately went to work on creating the scope and pacing guides for grades K through seven. Both councils also took on the immense task of revising the K-5 report cards. We were moving right along and then, March 13th, 2020, everything came to a screeching halt. After a brief hiatus during the 2020-21 school year so that we could deal with that pesky COVID, we hit the ground running in 2021. The drafts of the standards-based report cards were finally completed for all four content areas and the social development section. We're all ready for feedback. In total, there were seven versions of the report cards until we got to lucky number eight. The Social Studies Curriculum Leadership Council completed their scope and pacing guides and created curriculum overview documents for grades K through seven. Because there was no MCAS in the spring of 2020, DESE advised districts to administer a computer-based assessment system in order to measure and track student progress. With the significant disruptions and varied student engagement during remote learning during the spring, educators were preparing for a critically important fall reentry and how to best understand and assess where their students were academically in order to effectively make instructional decisions that would support their students' individual needs while maintaining on grade level expectations. The district chose NWA map growth for both reading and math grades K through 10. The assessment is an adaptive assessment aligned to Massachusetts standards and capable of projecting proficiency on MCAS. 
What it does not measure that MCAS does is a student's ability to write proficiently in each of the genres, argument, narrative, and expository informational. In order to address this, the Literacy Curriculum Council began working on creating on-demand text-based writing prompts. More on this a bit later in the presentation. That brings us to the current school year. K-5 standards-based report cards were implemented. Both the Literacy and Social Studies Councils created multiple text-based prompts and collected feedback from teachers. New social studies curriculum resources were rolled out in grades K through seven, and a resource scope and pacing guide was created for grades K through three to lay out for teachers how each resource is used within every unit of study to address the grade level learning expectations. We've also begun to learn about our new curriculum and instruction platform through PowerSchool, which will allow easier access and integration of our curriculum in all content areas. The purpose of a standards-based report card is to inform parents and caregivers about their children's progress towards specific learning standards that are set forth by the Massachusetts Department of Education and adopted by the district. In a standards-based system, the score represents what is learned, where the student is in relation to the end of the year expectations. I know these are hard to see, but they are available on the website. Um, the K-5 report cards are up there for you to look at. So here are some examples for literacy in grades two and social studies in grades three. Anyone who's familiar with the previous report card knows just how much more detailed and descriptive these performance indicators are. Prior to this year, they were parent companion documents for each content area, explaining what the learning expectations were for that year. Teachers regularly expressed their desire to have a report card that was both more user-friendly and better communicated what was the focus for learning that year. The two most significant challenges were in first, explaining the standards in parent-friendly language so that it was accessible to all, and second, accurately reporting on where each student was at that moment measured against end of year proficiency. The standards listed are what the student is expected to know and or be able to do by June. So it is perfectly reasonable for a student to be graded a two in December, which is partially meeting, on something like compares and contrasts two texts on the same topic or story. But as we've approached our third time using the new report card this year, stakeholders are adjusting accordingly. Along with the updated content descriptors, the social development section of the report card was updated to reflect the CASEL social and emotional competencies as outlined by DESI. In previous years, teachers reported on areas that a student was struggling with, identifying them with a T for targets to improve. Additionally, teachers scored students on conduct and effort. While both are immensely important to the overall success of a student both in and out of the classroom, they are subjective and not very descriptive. Now, the competencies are broken down into categories, responsible decision-making, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship skills. Students are rated on each descriptor under those five categories, giving a much clearer picture of a student's strengths and areas for improvement. According to a recent report issued by Indeed, the top 10 skills that employees are looking for are effective communication, leadership, teamwork, interpersonal, adaptability, self-management, organization, computer skills, problem solving, open-mindedness, and a strong worth ethic. And as you can see, evidence of those can be found all throughout the social emotional competencies identified. Okay, ready to play a little game? Yes, Ms. Santini, we're ready to play a little game. <clears throat> In this game, Joe's getting a little nervous over there. <laughs> Contestants will read a prompt from the 2022 Grade 6 MCAS. And there will be three reading standards from the English Language Arts and Literacy Framework to choose from. <clears throat> and from that, you're going to choose the one that best matches what the students are being asked to demonstrate. Okay? So here's the prompt. Write an essay that explains how an idea is developed in an article and a passage. Is it, number one, cite textual evidence to support analysis of what it tastes Te a text states explicitly as well as inferences drawn. Number two, determine a text's central ideas and how particular details help convey the ideas. Or number three, analyze in detail how a key individual event or idea is introduced, illustrated, and elaborated in a text. Anyone want to? I'll vote on two. Okay. Two, two, anybody else? All right, the answer is number three. Analyze, 
analyze in detail how a key individual event or idea is introduced, illustrated, and elaborated in a text. But no fret, because there really isn't a wrong answer. A prompt of that depth does require multiple skills. The actual, no, this is grade six. The actual sixth grade MCAS item asks students to read an article and a passage from a book and then answer this exact prompt. Write an essay that explains how ways to reuse items and the junction each show that reuse is beneficial, which I think is interesting considering what Molly talked about earlier. Be sure to use information from both the article and the passage to develop your essay. So not only are students scored on the content of their response, but they are also scored on the quality of their writing, spelling, punctuation, correct use of grammar, sentence structure, etc. This is a significant shift in MCAS expectations for students in grades three through eight. In the past, their responses to red text were not scored for conventions, so their focus was on answering the question correctly and providing adequate evidence from the text to support. Members of the Literacy Curriculum Leadership Council recognize the need to create opportunities for students to practice the skill and receive specific and targeted feedback for improvement. It also provides teachers with important information about student proficiency in order to effectively plan for instruction. This type of assessment, while MCAS motivated, does actually mirror the kinds of tasks that many individuals are expected to perform in their jobs today, summarizing, synthesizing, analyzing, evaluating, and explaining information. So this is an example of a text-based prompt in a first grade classroom using the interactive read aloud. The story was read aloud to the class and they also had it available to them digitally on their iPads so they could go back to the story and help find three facts about the polar bear. This provided teachers with the resources they needed, the standards being assessed, the activity, and the criteria for scoring. Each grade level was given a prompt to launch and then the team collected feedback. Our goal was to provide them with the model for this assessment and then utilize professional learning community time to offer support and guidance as they created their own. Teachers took to the task immediately and realized that they could use their guided reading text so that students could read the text independently and answer a standards-based prompt. Here's another example from a sixth grade social studies prompt. Students were given two pieces of text, an article and a play, and asked to write an essay on how the Sumerians viewed the gods and goddesses that they believed existed. In the rubric, you can see that the students were scored on their content knowledge, citing evidence from a text to support analysis of a primary source document, and supporting a claim with evidence in an argument. The 2018 History and Social Science Framework has embedded the reading, writing, speaking, and listening literacy standards into each grade level content. This year, our elementary schools welcomed many authors into their classrooms to bring the art of writing to life. A diverse group of authors were able to join us this year. We had Josh Funk, who's a local author and software engineer. Len Cabral is an internationally acclaimed storyteller who has been enchanting audiences with his storytelling performances at schools, libraries, museums, and festivals since 1976. Len's strong Cape Verdean ancestry comes alive in his exuberant retelling of African, Cape Verdean, and Caribbean folk tales as well as original stories and tales from around the world. Anna Crespo was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. She decided to become an author after realizing that there weren't any books by Brazilian authors or featuring Brazilian characters on the library shelves. And born in the small coastal town of Ensenada in Baja, California, Mexico, Monica Mancilas moved with her parents to the United States when she was just two years old. Her books center on themes of identity, culture, and mental health while challenging those outdated tropes that have historically left Latin voices in the margins. Poetry also came back in full swing with students, both big and small, reciting either their own poems or poems from authors that they admired. Performing a poem is a bit like acting. Poems are meant to exist out loud, to be spoken, heard, remembered, and passed on. Students learn elements of physical presence, voice, articulation, speed, volume, and tone without having to present their own work, which is sometimes more intimidating for most students. Students often gravita gravitate to poems that re fit their reading level and also match a personal interest or philosophy, which is great. But there are also lots of serendipitous mismatches that end up stretching students' skills in ways a teacher could not devise. Simply put, there's a poem for everyone. Two years ago, the primary literacy coaches began working with the Rotary Club of Yarmouth to provide books to our families pre-K to three. The Literacy Initiative has been fabulous for our students. And the Rotary Club has donated 10,000 books over the last two years with plans to continue next year. 
I want to share with you a few of the images captured during Anna Crespo's visit in late March. Anna spent a morning in each of the three elementary schools, welcoming grade, each grade level with enthusiasm. The best part of these visits, though, was seeing the reactions of those students who are also from Brazil and whose native language is Portuguese literally sparkle with joy at hearing a voice like theirs, reading from a book where the characters looked and sounded and lived lives like theirs. And when they got to stand up in front of their peers and lead them in a quick game of Simon Says using their own language, the smiles were leaping off of their faces. The air was electrified with their excitement. And this is what we mean when we say students need windows and mirrors. For months now, there has been a raging debate over whether the science of reading should be the primary approach to the literacy instruction. The version of the science of reading that is presented in the media, however, is very narrow, focusing mainly on alphabetics, phonics, and word reading. The five components of reading instruction from the National Reading Panel are phonics, which is letter, letter blends, phonemic awareness, which is that those letters and letter blend sounds make words, vocabulary, knowing what a word means, comprehension, understanding the words, sentences, paragraphs, and text as a whole, and fluency, sounding out words effortless, effortlessly and making meaning a second nature. The National Center for Improving Literacy could, would concur with the National Reading Panel when explaining the basics of the science of reading. And as a matter of fact, they explicitly state that it is not to drill and kill phonics. And yet, the crux of those spouting the science of reading argument is that there needs to be an intense focus on phonics instruction in isolation, and that a balanced literacy approach does not expect students to sound out words they don't know, but instead guess or rely on pictures or context. These assumptions are completely false. Our students receive daily phonics instruction, daily direct reading instruction at their instructional level, and are exposed to challenging diverse texts. Founders to Pinnell Classroom is a research-based comprehensive literacy system for effective reading, writing, and language competencies. It includes thousands of high-quality books allowing students to read, listen to, talk about, and write about a wide range of text types, text complexities, and genres to meet grade-level standards. Careful attention was paid when curating these collections to include a balance of genres, topics, and diverse perspectives that allow for windows, mirrors, and sliding doors in all of our classrooms. Explicit systematic phonics as well as vocabulary lessons are provided in the phonics, spelling, and word study kit. Intentional vocabulary support is also embedded in the instructional routines of each element of the literacy framework. MAP growth scores for students in grades <coughs> K through 2 show steady growth over the last three years, with 85% of our current third graders on track to meet MCAS expectations. Thanks to the expertise and genius of Meredith Henderson, who's sitting over there, literacy coach at Baker, teachers now have a comprehensive plan for how to effectively and efficiently use the resources available to them to support instruction. This is a visual of the grade one curriculum resource scope and pacing guide. While the teachers still need to customize the lessons to meet the needs of their students, scaffolding and extending is needed. This provides them with a consistent starting point. I just want to say that I couldn't do any of the work that I do without my coaches, and they're all going to curse me right now, but Meredith, Lisa, <coughs> Mary, and Jen are the literacy coaches for the district K through five, and the work that they do in each building with teachers and students is phenomenal. So thank you, and don't look at me like that. <coughs> We added a number of social studies resources this year to support teachers in their standards-based units. Massachusetts Our Home is a custom-made Massachusetts history program created to be engaging and accessible for all third grade students. The narrative text takes a skill-based approach to, in, to literacy instruction by using primary source analysis and questions to promote critical thinking. The six-chapter textbook covers Massachusetts' diverse geography, history, government, and economics. Children Discovering Justice is a Massachusetts standards-based K-5 civics curriculum engaging students in topics such as community, rules, leadership, and equity while answering the essential question, what is justice and how do I use my voice to advocate for it? The curriculum provides students with the foundational knowledge, skills, and dispositions to be engaged, critical, compassionate, and active leaders of our democracy and provides teachers with the culturally responsive scaffolds, entry points, and tangibles to explore critical topics and conversations. Students learn best when completely immersed in their learning environment, and they learn best when activities are memorable. TCI integrates engaging activities aligned with state-specific standards into every unit. Units are, include hands-on activities, inquiry-based lessons, and ELA integration. 
There are consumable workbooks and online resources for student activities and assessments. And we use that for grades four, five, and then six, seven. Grade four is regions, grade five is America's history, and grade six and seven is ancient world. In the coming year, we will continue to examine our text sets, focusing on the community book list for grades six through 12. The Literacy Curriculum Leadership Council will use the culturally responsive curriculum scorecard created by the Education Justice Research and Organizing Collaborative out of the NYU Metropolitan Center on Equity in the Transformation of Schools. We will also work on incorporating the Massachusetts Digital Literacy and Computer Science Standards into our current units of study in both literacy and social studies, as well as identifying the knowledge and skills learning, knowledge and skill learning targets for these units. Both councils will continue to build on the collection of text-based writing prompts, providing teachers with additional prompts and supporting PLCs as they continue to author their own. Work has begun on migrating our curriculum units of study over the new platform on PowerSchool. And lastly, we are planning two professional learning opportunities for teachers in grades K through four to support their social studies instruction. Questions or comments? Questions? Comments? Bill. Once again, the professionalism that is displayed and exemplified by your presentation makes me realize I was born too soon. Uh, you've heard me say this before because while I have a lot of pride in my home schooling system in Lansing, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, and I watched my two daughters go through DY and graduate years ago. But the depth of thinking and planning and using research and looking at the students as individuals and yet trying to match their strengths with the material that is presented and keeping track of where the kids who are at risk or who have need additional help. So you exemplified that in your presentation. It is not, it is not my grandparents or my daughter's parents' school system. So I am very proud of what I have seen and heard, including even how the students to my right are exemplified by not end product, but the beginning of a journey. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Anybody else? Tomas? <clears throat> Just wanted to say thank you for all that you do for our students. You know, having a younger son in the district, it's learning how much learning to read means. And those of you who don't know, we, we talk about the math scores. Math is not math. Math is reading. <laughs> reading. It's all reading. And it, it, it's understanding the importance of if someone can't read, they can't do math. And to know how important it is to put the work into our literacy programs and to follow all the steps that they talk about, the, the students aren't going to achieve anywhere in, in school if they can't learn the basics of reading because everything that is now is, is based on that, you know. And I say that because of math. And, you know, I know some students that have trouble with math, and it's not because they don't do the math. It's because they can't understand the reading. So it's, it's making sure that we have the literacy coaches that we have and we get them as young as we can and, and identify the problems early um, so that we can get them where they need to be at, you know, they call it at level. You know, you keep hearing, you know, are they at level or below level? And it's making sure that we have the resources they need when they're at below level. Because if they get skipped at kindergarten first, when they get to second and third, if they're not at level, then they're not being able to to complete their normal work. So, you know, I think whatever we can do to make sure that the resources are there for for that is, is it needs to be asked and, you know, we as a committee need to make sure we can do it for you. Thank you. Yeah, that does tell to what I was going to ask. Uh, Tom else was saying, um, is there any programs or any resources or anything that you need for from us, you know you can come and, and ask us, but um, if there's anything you can think of in the near future now that, that you think we we should do, um, please let us know, but thank, thank you. 
Mine is more of a question. Thank you. This was a very detailed uh, overview of humanities and literacy K-5. So I, I put a lot of pieces together. Um, I would love a copy of this because I want to digest sure. some more. But I'm one, what I'm wondering, and uh, should I, if I want to understand how this continuum continues, especially sixth and seventh grade, uh, should I go to that same website and look at the scope and sequence there, or are you coming back <laughs> in the fall? Um, I, you know, I want to put the pieces together and see how you migrate through the different so grade levels. Six through twelve is. Um, well, they're all unit-based, but 6 through 12 takes our um, community books, and that's the vehicle by which we deliver the learning experiences that are standards-based. Um, when I first started teaching, the, the idea was for, and actually, I'd say, I'm going to say this, uh, Dr. Catherine Snow makes the argument as well that by fourth, fifth grade, they're, it's less learning to read and more reading to learn. As the students go up in ages, you'll, if you look at the continuum of language arts frameworks, they're the same 10 standards in reading information, reading literature, same writing standards. It just, it gets, um, it goes, becomes more complex with what they're at, the demands. More complex text, more analysis, <clears throat> and so on. So we build off of that. Students that are below grade level in grades six and seven, if they're one to two years, they participate in STARI, which is a strategic um, adolescent reading intervention, um, S-T-A-R-I, um, that was developed by uh, through Harvard University. And then students that are further below will receive a more intense intervention. It might be Wilson, it could be Wharton Gillingham, it could be L. It depends on what their needs are. What we're trying to do a better job of every day is matching the need. One size doesn't fit all. It's one of the issues sometimes with um, what are referred to in the educational world as basils, um, where you, you're teaching to the middle. What's the middle? Um, it's not to say that every single student has their own customized um, learning plan, but a basil isn't meant to meet the needs of everybody. It's meant to be a starting point, and then you plan off of that. Um, that's not usually the way they're used, though. It's what we're used to in our own learning experiences. So as we get up into the higher grades, it's adding more complex text, having them grapple with different types of text, looking at nonfiction text. Because think about in your daily life, unless you read for pleasure, which I hope you do, but for the most part, what you read is nonfiction text. It was the only good thing that came out of the Park test. I don't know if you remember 2015. Um, it's almost as bad as 2020. Um, it made a, it forced us to, to add in nonfiction text because no, being able to manipulate that is it's a, it's a it is truly a life skill. Um, I think about Molly's um, speech and all the research and reading and synthesis that she had to do to create that right. So, she, but she had an interest. She saw something that sparked something in her right. So there's that window. But she created a mirror for all of us. And that sliding door is that she stepped into it and she wants to do something about it. That's she kind of. I wish I could say I set that up, and I, but I didn't. But she, that really embodies what we're trying to do in all of our classrooms. It's not just in the literacy classroom. Um, so on the website, you'd see the curriculum overview documents. The scope and pacing guides are, are teacher documents that exist on our platform um, that I'd be happy to, to share with you, but they're not available publicly because um, they, they, they change from year to year. But I'm happy to share them with you if you want to um, give me a call and come in. So you can see what it looks like. I don't know if I answered your question. I could go on and on about this. So, yeah. uh, And I have another question. Your definition of adding a piece of digital literacy, can you, is that yeah. more so, uh, understanding sources or learning how to it's, search? If, it's, a, it's a little bit of all of it. It depends on where, you, where a child is in their learning of what doing research is. So you might start with being able to identify a resource. What is it? Why? And what makes it a good, a credible resource? Um, I don't know if you know Wikipedia. Anybody can go in and change those facts. It's not necessarily reliable, but we people quote it all the time. Um, when I was doing my research for this presentation, I spent hours because I I needed to verify what I was finding. I wasn't going to go to the first one I read, especially if it fit what I wanted it to say. Right? You can find something to match anything. But, but I wanted to be able to really have a deeper understanding of it. So depending on where you are, 
in your your journey around research, for example. But the idea for the digital literacy standards is making them um, real. So it's it's not it's an authentic task. It's not something that has been devised so that we can check it off and say we did it. So it's what are the opportunities that we have to bring in digital skills? I give the example all the time about a child reads a book. Um, and we have them write a book review. That's a skill. It's a, it's a, it's a type of writing. And then, so they've read a book, they've written a review, now they're gonna record it, and they make a QR code, and it's gonna go on the book, and now when the next student comes in and they wanna know what that book is about, they can scan it with their iPad and read my review. So that's an authentic use of digital literacy. So it's giving them the tools to expand their learning, but in a, uh, in, like I said, in, a, in an authentic way. You're welcome. That's great. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I appreciate your presentation. It was it was great. Um, I, I was really happy to see the different um, the diversity in the authors that you brought in. I think that's that's really important. that's all the coaches. They did all that. Yeah. I, again, it's it, it, was, it was it was incredible. Fantastic. To see that, you know, you talked about the Brazilian students and things like that. That it's a, it's amazing. And Lenka Brawl has been around for years. My kids saw Len. Um, you know, and again, you've done a lot of work. Your, your literacy coaches are out there in the trenches and they're the ones that are bringing stuff back to you. So I, I appreciate all you do for the students and, and you all work together really good. So thank you. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, what else we have, Carol? Thank you, Sherry. And thanks to our coaches. Um, just one thing I wanted to uh, bring to your attention. Um, we uh, had some conversations at the administrative level about some of what we're gonna do for our open houses and things like that next year. And because we decided to change a couple of the open house dates, uh, what we'd like to have you do, even though the calendar itself is not really changing, uh, we want to be able to change the approved date at the top of the calendar. So I'm asking you to reapprove the calendar as of this date so that when we put it out there uh, we can say it's the calendar that is dated such and so a date where we have the and the really the biggest the biggest change is we did move the Emmy small uh, open house date uh, from what it was before uh, it was Emmy small was on the 20th but um, we, we I'm sorry wait a minute sure I got the right one Emmy Small was on the 26th, and we moved that to the 20th, I believe. Yeah, yes. to the 20th. And um, that is because we're going to put the intermediate and middle school um, on the same dates, different times, but we thought it, thought it might be more convenient for parents if they had to go to the school. They could come for one of their younger kids and then go. And it's a little bit, a, a little different at elementary open sort of what we call intermediate and elementary open houses than it would be um, at a um, more middle school open house. So that way parents can get through the whole, and we'll just expand the time, you know, keep it, make sure we have enough time for parents to get through. But we just thought that would be a little, a little easier if okay. we. Do you want a motion, Joe? Yeah, we need a motion to change that. Yeah, a motion to uh, change the approved date of the Dennis Yarmouth Regional School District 2023-24 school calendar to 5-15-23. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any discussion? I don't think of that. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carol. That's all I, that's all I have. Can I ask a superintendent a question? Um, Thank you for that wonderful open house. I didn't know if that was coming later. Um, and I believe there was a site visit by uh, those in attendance at Emmy Small. Any feedback? I did not go there. So I would turn that over to Dave and Maria, who did. Well, I think that. Um, <clears throat> 
What was his last? Jack. What's his last? <laughs> McCarthy. McCarthy. Yeah, McCarthy. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Yeah, Jack McCarthy. I think it was a little bit of, you know, eye-opening and enlightening for him to put his eyes on the wards that had previously been on our submitted um, statement of interest so that he could see in person exactly what we've been talking about with the needs for the building, how it is a little undersized, never mind just, you know, it's not just old, but it just doesn't fit the needs and the size and the programs that we should be having for an elementary school. And, you know, there's no guarantees, but the first step is that the whole team comes down and looks at a building before you get the recommendation stage. And he said that he was certainly going to put the word into the team that this is a building that they should come and visit in the fall. So that was uh, encouraging to hear from him. Thank you, Dave. That's that's good to hear. Yeah. It's good for them to put, you know, especially the, the people that make, make those decisions and sit in those meetings um, have the eyes on it. So I think that that's important. That kind of rolls well into the, uh, the next item, the um, school building committee report. Um, I don't have much to report. I think, you know, the school's up and running. Some, you know, the kinks are still being worked out here and there, hopefully, right? Good. Um, but, it, you know, it was. It was a great open house. It was well attended. Um, it's a beautiful school. And it, uh, we're going to have probably one or two more building committee meetings just to wrap things up and, and finish things out. And, um, you know, we'll look down the line. I mean, we started this, pr this project in 2016, but I think we put a notice of, intent for four years or five years beforehand so you know 2011 this has been going you know been trying to get this something done so um, it's been a number of years so um, hopefully the Emmy small school project and our our submission gets picked up quicker so Joe uh, just a quick question Joe um, formally when do you wrap up with the with the the consultants and the builder and and when do you say, okay, you're done, and this was a figure and all of that? How does that come up? It, it does take a while. I don't have an answer. In fact, I, I just I had emailed um, Perkins Eastman's about that uh, last week just to ask them, you know, how many more meetings should we have? You know, when do we when do we say, you know, goodbye to you? When can we stop calling you and bugging you and emailing you and things like that? And you know, I think it'll be it'll be a while. The final numbers and the final the final crutch numbers are going to take some time because there's some stuff that still has to be finished. There's a couple more smaller projects like the bathrooms on the fields have to be done and those won't probably be completed till the fall, winter time sometime. So it'll be a little while. I don't know, if Dave, you have any more information on that? No, I mean, the it, it, it will take time as Joe was saying, mainly because there's also, you know, the project managers in them, they'll stay with us until everything is finally addressed. You know, like with any building project, there's probably still a couple hundred items that are still punch list items. They might be as small as a piece of trim that fell off or a piece of rug that needs to be replaced. But they, Perkins Eastman, the architects and PMA, they'll stay on top of it until it's done. And then once we say that the spending is done, such as you know, the bathrooms or there's some controls on the lights outside or lighting things, there's still some minor pieces that we're waiting to come in that haven't shown up yet. So once you're done, you pay the final bills. I'm just making this up six months from now. We can tell the MSBA, we think we're done, done. And then they'll come in, do their final audit, and then release the final payment to us, and then we'll be essentially done at that point in time. And like moving into your house, and Mike and Tim can attest, you know, they're finding out that even with all the furniture and things that they picked out for us, you're still finding that, gee, we're missing this. We could use that. We'd like that. And it's still within the FF&E furniture fixture equipment budget that wasn't completely spent to address these things. So we have 30, 40 items that are about to be on order right now just that we've thought of once they've moved in that we need. And then those will take a couple months to come in. So it does take a little bit of growing into now that it's there. So it's usually going to be six to nine months, I think, before we could say we're done, done with the project. And that's a good thing, too, because <coughs> if they were gone, then you can't go back to them and say we need this or you know that punch list could grow something you discovered that you didn't realize so exactly it, it's they, a good and they, thing and they monetize the punch list so it's things that we haven't paid for yet so if the vendor wants their full payment they're going to send the crew back to address these items that's great okay um the next item is the school committee liaisons to the boards of selectmen um so anything from dennis i don't think so i'm letting dennis but know if there's anything um yarmouth joe just one thing uh elections tomorrow so please get out and vote it means a lot to everybody to come out it means a lot for the district it shows support for our community um and you know 
the more people that get out, the better it is for our community. So get out and vote. I'll second that. Thank you, Joe. Um, let's see. Uh, assistant superintendent's report. Well, Joey just kind of mentioned the uh, the new school wrapping up, and we just did, so that's <laughs> it for tonight. <laughs> that was pretty good, huh? <laughs> um, okay, the uh, the next item is the superintendent search. Um, we're well on our way. We've got our book of of um, candidates that were prepared. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, and uh, the um, applications closed as of this afternoon, so. Um, the committee will be meeting again next week to um, go over them and we'll, we'll kind of go through them and kind of find a few or a couple, you know, good candidates and that's when we'll turn it over to the committee and we kind of get it to the committee and um, have them, that we'll do interviews with the committee and things like that. Joe? Uh, just one thing, so uh, do you have a rough number or do you know what that number that you have now and and you're going to weed it down to three or two? Or I haven't, yeah, I haven't looked to see um, today or over the weekend. I think we're, I think it was seven or eight, maybe, um, maybe more, but yeah, right around there. So, and then you're going to bring three back to us or two? Yeah. Back so to what us? the plan is, we'll get, we'll get, um, we'll go through them, and then we'll we'll do a uh, for a, an interview with them, um, and then kind of weed through them. The MS MASC is also going to work with us on this. So we've um, we've kind of grabbed them. They they've agreed that they'll look at some of them or look it'll look at all of them and, and um, kind of give us their thoughts and feedback on them. So Thank yeah. Thank you. Um, the consent agenda is in our packet. Um, there is a uh, surplus of several items at the Dennis Yarmouth Regional High School Library, as per Miss Bennett's May first, twenty twenty three memo with accompanying photographs and uh, surplus several hundred outdated math student workbooks as well as 50 outdated professional resource books as per Mrs. Pontius's May 9th, 2023 memo and the minutes of May 1st. We could do it as a single motion. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion on the surplus items? Does anybody want them? Kind of thing. Um, okay. Hearing none. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. Um, bills, requisitions, and payroll. Do we need a motion for the minutes, Joe? Uh, motion to approve the May 1st minutes. Okay. I, I thought you included that. I'm I sorry. don't think yep. Phil said that, so I'll make a motion sure. to approve the May 1st minutes. Okay. Second. Okay. Any discussion on the May 1st minutes? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Um, bills, requisitions, and payroll is here. The calendars, we just went over that. Uh, public comment. Um, if there's anybody from the public that's here that'd like to speak or say something, um, feel free to get up. You have three minutes. I don't see anybody, so um, I think that is all we have, unless there's anybody else that has anything else. We're good? Okay. Motion to adjourn. There isn't a second. <laughs> <laughs> all in favor? <laughs> 